Hey everyone, in this episode of the On.NET Show, we're going to learn about building distributed applications with the Dapper framework. So this is going to be really exciting. So I hope you all stay tuned and check it out. Hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of the On.NET Show. And today we're going to learn about the distributed application runtime otherwise known as Dapper. So I have someone here from the Dapper team, Aman, who's going to tell us a little bit about what it is and how does it work and how we could use it inside of our .NET applications. So Aman, why don't you introduce yourself for our folks really quickly. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what do you do on the team? Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, hi, this is Aman and I work as an engineering manager on the Azure Compute team and I'm a core maintainer on the Dapper project. Awesome. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what Dapper is exactly? Yeah, so Dapper is a uh, event-driven programming model uh, which exposes certain building block capabilities for creating microservices as a sidecar architecture to the user application code. So it exposes core functionalities as a bunch of gRPC and HTTP APIs, which user application can call into and leverage those functionalities. Some of the functionalities which Dapper exposes are uh, state store capabilities, pub sub capabilities, and actor runtime built into Dapper uh, sidecar, uh, secret store capabilities, and bindings and triggering capabilities. We'll go into more detail as we as we progress through the show. Sure. One of the things I'm wondering is, you know, I remember the team had announced Dapper. I think it was Ignite's 2019. Um, yep. You know, that announced the announced the project along with some other things. Mm -hmm. What was the main catalyst for <clears throat> wanting to start the project, right? Like, why why did the team say, oh, this is a good thing for us to do? Like, we really want to build this. Okay. So the main idea behind Dapper project is to enable enterprise application developers to uh, so that they can write microservices applications in a really easy way without having to worry about the underlying state store implementations or pub sub implementations. It exposes all that in a convenient uh, gRPC or HTTP APIs from Dapper. So all developers need to know is is just Dapper APIs. They don't need to know about that is APIs if they are storing in Azure, is in Redis, they don't need to know about Azure APIs if they are storing in Azure. They just interact with Dapper APIs and Dapper takes care of all the heavy lifting under the hood for you. Okay, so that sounds to me like Dapper provides an abstraction over various um, you know, concerns around building microservices. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a little bit easier for me as a developer to use. And kind of like what you said, I don't need to know about specific implementations about messaging queues and caches and you know, yep. distributed traces and things like that, you know, but instead like I could use and rely on Dapper itself and you know, a lot of those things would be taken care of for me, so to speak, yeah? So one core principle for Dapper is to be vendor neutral platform agnostic. You can run it on any platform, uh, use components from any vendor like storage from AWS, GCP or from Azure and it's even uh, cloud neutral. You can run it on Edge, you can run it on any cloud, or even your own hosted platforms if you wish. Awesome, that sounds good. I know you brought some slides. Why don't we take a look at them and see you know, some of the stuff that you, you know, can do with Dapper? Sure, definitely. Okay, so uh, these are the slides talking about Dapper, which is distributed applications runtime. Um, you can uh, know more about it by going to dapper.io. It's an open source project hosted on GitHub. Uh, the repository is github.com slash dapper slash dapper. It's D-A-P-R. And it's a portable event-driven runtime for building distributed applications. Next, we go into a little bit layering. Uh, well, uh, next, we go into the dapper goals. The, the goal for Dapper is to uh, build applications using any language with any framework. And we provide best practices for all the building blocks. And you can write in any language, any framework, I want it to be consistent, portable APIs, and then you can run it on any platform, cloud or edge environments. Next, we move, <clears throat> move on to the uh, various building blocks of the Dapper uh, runtime. As you can see, Dapper consists of all these building blocks, service to service invocation, state management, pub sub, actors, secrets, and observability. And uh, you can run it on any cloud or edge infrastructure. The, functionalities are exposed over these HTTP or gRPC APIs. And then you write your code in any language, Go, Node, Python, .NET, C++, basically any language which supports HTTP or gRPC invocations. And then you can leverage all these capabilities from Dapper. 
so this slide shows how the sidecar architecture comes into play when Dapper is hosted on a Kubernetes uh, 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 Kubernetes cluster. So there are, certain, there are certain control plane services from Dapper which run uh, inside the Kubernetes cluster. One is an actor placement service, which is used when you're uh, using the actor capabilities from Dapper. Then there is Sidecar Injector, which injects a Dapper Sidecar when you deploy your applications to Kubernetes. Then Sentry Service is used uh, because Dapper provides you MTLS out of box when you're doing service invocation between your two services. And then Operator uh, takes care of the comp uh, CRDs deployed to Kubernetes uh, cluster. These are Dapper CRDs which are deployed, uh, like state store or pub sub components. And the bottom half shows uh, what happens on a Kubernetes uh, cluster node. Uh, this is uh, the user application code. It has a sidecar running uh, next to it, and application calls into uh, Dapper runtime over HTTP or gRPC. Uh, then the right side of the slide shows the various components. These are community-driven, and these are vendor-neutral. Uh, for resource binding, you can see it can call into Event Hub, Kafka, AWS, GCP. Similarly, for state store, there are various options available. Uh, similar is true for PubSub and for distributed tracing as well. And then uh, these are loaded as a sidecar to your application, and you can leverage all these capabilities. Now, as you're going through some of these things, one of the things I've wondered is, you know, how big is Dapper exactly? Because when I see all of these different resource bindings and state stores and all the stuff that you support, I'm expecting that, wow, this I must have a really big sidecar. Like this must be a huge process mm -hmm. if it supports all of these additional things. Is is that the case? Is Dapper like, am I gonna have to download like a gig of you know stuff to run this? Or is is you know how flexible it is exactly for me to like deploy and, and use this thing in my application? Mm. So Dapper is is written in Go, it uses Go modules. And the sidecar size for Dapper is really small. All these components are loaded in there. You can think of them as statically linked there, but okay. they are not initialized into into your sidecar uh, until you tell Dapper to do so by by apply by deploying a CRD for state store. Uh, so the state store for Redis or AWS would only be initialized in your Dapper sidecar when you ask Dapper to create a Dapper, uh, sorry, to create a AWS state store or Redis state store in it. But the binary is statically linked you. Okay, great. That's awesome. And then I'm guessing too, because Dapper is also open source, um, and you know it's also on GitHub. If folks want to use a particular resource or component or something like that that's not available today, you know they could always open up an issue or submit a PR if they wanted to to have those additional pieces added into the ones that exist. Oh, yes, definitely. In fact, when Dapper started <clears throat> as an open source project in, in late 2019, it, it started with only a few of the components available for each of the building blocks. And yeah. over the past six to eight months, we have seen lots of community contribution to all these components. Like Nats is one example, and all the HashiCorp uh, uh, components which are added, they, they all came through open source community contribution. So yes, you're right, people can uh, go and extend the capabilities for Dapper. Well, that's great. So then what I'm hearing too from you is that there's a really rich community that not only exists in Microsoft, but there's other companies, like you said, like HashiCorp and the Nats folks and, and other open source tooling that are contributing to Dapper to kind of expand the ecosystem. And Yes, definitely. Dapper has a very thriving community uh, as of now. So okay, that's great. Cool. Awesome. 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 Cool. Let's keep going. Okay, sure. Uh, so Next, we're going to focus mainly on the .NET side of the things. Uh, so Dapper uh, exposes the APIs over HTTP or gRPC, but then we are also creating uh, developer-friendly SDKs for multiple languages like Python, Java, Go, and .NET. So today, we're going to talk about the .NET SDK. So uh, in the .NET SDK, uh, the APIs are made available over HTTP and gRPC. So there's a bottom most layer in the .NET SDK, which is an auto-generated um, um, uh, code from Proto-C. On top of that, we create some helper APIs for <clears throat> save state, uh, publish events, uh, invoke service, or trigger some bindings. And on top of those uh, uh, wrapper APIs, we have provided ASP.NET Core integration as well, so that you can uh, directly use Dapper by using some annotations or ASP.NET Core friendly way of uh, 
uh, creating controllers and routers. We'll go into that detail when we go through the demos. And then users can uh, use uh, users can write their application at any level. They can directly drop down to the HTTP layer if they want directly to talk to Dapper over HTTP, or they can use the auto generated Proto C uh, auto generated binary from Proto C to make the calls, or if they want to use our Dapper APIs, they can hook into those and then write application from there. And Dapper also provides an uh, actor runtime. So .NET HTTP provides a uh, sorry .NET SDK provides an actor runtime layer, which is interacting with Dapper over HTTP and users write their actor application using this .NET uh, actor runtime. Got it, got it. And yeah, I'm particularly interested too to to learn about the app the actor um, implementation of Dapper mm -hmm. because I find like. Every platform and ecosystem has its own implementation of actors, and you know, with looking at Dapper and seeing how you know it's it's somewhat language neutral, you know what I mean. Being able to have an implementation that does you know a lot of these patterns, including actors, in a way that I don't need like a .NET SDK or I don't need like a Python or a Go SDK, and we can all use actors together in in a very distributed way is very interesting. Oh yes, that that's definitely true with Dapper. If if you look at other .NET actor implementations like uh, Service Fabric Reliable Actors or Orleans or Akka uh, .NET, uh, they uh, you can write your actors, but but you can then invoke only through .NET clients. What happens with Dapper? The core functionalities of an actor runtime are brought into your uh, Dapper sidecar, and then um, uh, you implement your actor actor code in your language specific. Uh, code of your application and Dapper Saika provides all the actor functionalities. One benefit with Dapper is that now you can write your actor app in, in C sharp and then you can invoke it over HTTP. That means you can invoke uh, your actors from any language which supports HTTP. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So next we will uh, go into details of uh, the, the actor model with Dapper. So Dapper follows a virtual actor model. Uh, which Service Fabric and, and Orleans also follow. So it came from Microsoft Research a while ago, then Orleans and Service Fabric productized it. And Dapper follows a similar virtual actor model. Uh, so uh, the Dapper actor model provides uh, following functionalities. It has a distribution and failover. It provides turn-based concurrency. By turn-based concurrency, I mean uh, actors are single-threaded uh, by definition. So when one call is going through, a, through an actor, uh, other calls will have to wait until that previous call finishes. So that uh, solves the problem of concurrency there. Developers don't need to worry about multi-threadedness in their actor code. It's just single-threaded code running in there. Got it. Then it also has an inbuilt state management. Uh, so using the rich APIs provided by Dapper SDKs, they can manage the state for a particular actor instance. And Dapper takes care of saving the state into a configured state store. I have a uh, question about actors there too. So I know there's a different actor, like we mentioned before, there's different actor frameworks, even within the .NET um, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I've heard different terms and I'm, I'm trying to, like I haven't built anything with actors before, but I'm kind of curious about, about what some of these terms mean. So for instance, I've heard about reliable actors, I've heard about virtual actors, and then there's regular actors. Or I'm okay. guessing there's regular actors. <laughs> like is there, like, like what, what exactly does it mean to be a virtual actor in Dapper? Is that, does that mean something different versus like a regular actor or a, a reliable actor? Okay. So in a, in a virtual actor pattern, what, what you do is you don't need to create an actor explicitly. You just make a call for a particular actor. And if uh, runtime detects that that, app, that actor doesn't exist, it will go and create an instance for an actor for you and call a method on it. Whereas a normal actor, you would go first create an actor, then call a method on it. In this case, you don't have to worry about whether an actor exists or not. When it comes to reliable actors, so reliable actors is a specific term used for service fabric actors uh, because service fabric has this concept of reliable services and then reliable actors were built on top of reliable services. So they just inherited the term reliable actors. So reliability over there means that the state is persisted and replicated uh, within the cluster itself when it comes to service fabric. So, so reliable actors within Dapper is, let's imagine I have a cluster of machines and you know different um, different dapper sidecars spread across these different machines. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing I can make I, you know I'll invoke some API against my sidecar 
and it'll go ahead and generate or create an actor on some of them in the machines. Like I don't know where it is. I don't create it. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't new it up with a constructor myself. You know, yeah. the within that dapper cluster or within that dapper network, it'll go ahead and figure it out, right? And now I'll be able to interact with that thing wherever it is. Yes, the, the, that's the idea. So from a from a client invoking an actor perspective, you'll just create a proxy and say, "Hi, I, I want to make a call to this particular actor ID," and mm -hmm. dapper runtime will figure out. And which of your ten instances of your application it needs to instantiate that actor? It yeah. will go and instantiate that actor in that application container, and then call the desired method on that. And then if your actor is saving state or modifying state, it will go and take care of that as well uh, by using Dapper's underlying state stores. Got it. Awesome. So this uh, uh, this shows uh, your actor uh, hosting within your application pod um, so let's say you create a video game uh, enemy actor and then it has a bunch of methods which are exposed over it and then uh, uh, these small circles are basically each instance of this actor so uh, dapper takes care of distributing these instances across multiple ho host and parts of your application uh, and it takes care of failover of your uh, application parts. Let's say you are this first part crashes or dies and then another part comes over. Dapper will take care of uh, moving uh, actor instances from your uh, host, which has just uh, uh, crashed to a new host so that you don't see a downtime for your actors. And it does that by using the placement service. So it takes care of uh, scaling your uh, actor instances across multiple parts of your application. So you can scale out your application. Let's say if the load on your actor service increases, you can add more instances of your actor application. And then Dapper Runtime will take care of automatically distributing those actor instances to new instances as you add them. Got it. Mm -hmm. So that uh, sounds pretty good. Do you have mm -hmm. any, any demos that we could take a look at? Like I'd definitely love to see what it actually looks like for .NET developers. Sure, definitely. I'll, I'll start with uh, actors since we since we just talked about them. Uh, so when it comes to C Sharp layer, uh, what a developer has to do for writing an actor is pretty simple. They just uh, define an interface which derives from my actor, and they set some and they define some methods in that interface. In this example, it's defining two methods: save data and get data, and then. Uh, they provide implementation of those two methods. Uh, so for providing an implementation, you define your class uh, deriving from actor. This actor is the base class provided by .NET SDK for Dapper. It contains a bunch of functionalities which are available to your actor. And then you implement your I demo actor interface. And in the implementation, you can see it's implementing these two methods called save data and get data. For saving a data, uh, let's say this method receives the data from the client side called my data, and then it interacts with uh, the underlying state store using the state manager APIs. So all they need to do is um, save state using the state manager, and then actor runtime will go and 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 save the state using configured state providers. It could be Redis or it could be Cosmos, whatever you you configured Dapper to run with. Then similarly, for getting a state for your actor, uh, you get the state from uh, state manager and then you return it back to your client sites. So okay. when it comes to uh, creating client sites, uh, uh, this is uh, how you create the clients. You create a proxy. You tell the proxy, hey, I want to talk to uh, actors of type demo actor. And then this is my actor ID. So in this case, it's going to make a call for actor ID called ABC. And then you get this rich interface when you are using a client SDK to make the calls. Uh, you can just say proxy dot save data, and it's and this proxy is created for this interface. So you get all the uh, IntelliSense here to invoke those methods. I know with some other actor frameworks, there's like additional hooks into like the actor lifetime and even handling errors and exceptions and those types of things. Does does um does Dapper at least the .NET SDK for Dapper have any of that type of stuff in it, or would that be more so something that the user has to take care of? Dapper itself takes care of the actor lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, so it provides a bunch of methods like activation and deactivation uh, hooks. 
uh, which are called into 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 the actor application when Dapper decides to activate an actor and or when Dapper decides to deactivate an actor. So let me go into a little bit details what activation means. So let's say a client made a call to Dapper uh, for a particular actor. If it doesn't exist, Dapper will instantiate that actor and then it will call an activate method on, on that actor. Uh, that activate method can be used to uh, prep something for that actor so that when the method call is invoked, certain states are already made available to it. It could be fetching some initial data from, from, a, from a remote store. Let's say you want to get some data from Event Hub or from your state store. Uh, you can grab it from there. And similarly, when Dapper decides to deactivate an actor, uh, the actors are deactivated if they are not active for a for a particular time. That time is configurable by default is one hour. So actor uh, so Dapper runtime calls the deactivate method on the actor instance. So that gives you the opportunity to do some cleanup. Like let's say you created some long living resources, uh, you get the opportunity to clean them up after your actor is deactivated. Got it. Um, so next we will. Uh, run a small actor application uh, using Dapper um, CLI. So Dapper comes with a with a cross-platform uh, CLI. You can use it to develop applications on Mac, Linux, on Windows. And it sets up your default uh, uh, development environment using Dapper. So the way you we use setup is you get the CLI and then you run Dapper in it. It would download the Dapper runtime and set up, set up some bare minimum uh, development environment for you. And then you can use the Dapper CLI to run your applications. This is an example of using Dapper CLI to run your application. Uh, uh, the format is uh, the command is Dapper run. It takes an application port. Uh, since Dapper needs to talk into your application, so it needs the port for your application. And this is the port for Dapper runtime at which it will start the Dapper runtime because Dapper will call into its sidecar APIs over this port over HTTP. And then there's the command to launch your application. So I'll run this application. This is an, this is going to run the same actor application which I just showed you, and Dapper runtime will go and and start creating actors in this application when I make a client call to it. Then we're going to make a client call to it. As I mentioned, that uh, you can make a call over HTTP. Uh, that means this actor can be invoked from from your Java, Go, or Python code, or even from a web browser anywhere as long as it has direct access to this cluster. Uh, so this is making a making a curl call. It's just saying that hey, I want to invoke this actor ABC of this type demo actor, and I want to invoke this save data method. And this is the data uh, which should be given to the actor instance when it, when the method is executed. So I'll make a call for it, and the call went to the Dapper. It saved the state, and then. Now I'm going to invoke this get data method, and this is going to go to the state manager and then retrieve the state and return it back to the client side. So when I make the call, I went to the state manager, received the call, received the data, and then returned it to the client side. So that's that. That's about actors. Next, I'm going to show you about the uh, .NET. Uh, APIs which we have created on top of auto-generated gRPC uh, APIs from Proto-C files. Uh, so Dapper provides a way to uh, call. So .NET SDK provides a way to call into Dapper runtime and perform certain operations like uh, publish an event, save state, get state from the Dapper runtime. So the usage is pretty easy. It uses the builder pattern. Uh, you create a client, say Dapper client builder. You give it some JSON CLS and options, and then you say build. So after that, you will get a client uh, to interact with Dapper. And then uh, you can see a bunch of APIs available to you uh, to interact with Dapper runtime. So uh, it has a bunch of state APIs. Uh, like managing the state, get state, delete state. It has APIs for secret management so that you can retrieve your secret in your application using Dapper Sidecar. Similarly, it has methods for invoking a binding and invoking uh, methods in your target service. Uh, so all all the user all you all as a user you have to do is create this Dapper client and then invoke these methods in your applications. It becomes really easy to save a state. You don't have to worry about knowing any of the SDKs from any of the cloud providers or from Redis or from 
or from Kafka or from or from any of the components. You just use these APIs and rest assured that your state would be saved saved in this configured state store. Nice. And you know, just for for folks that are watching, so this is kind of like a nice to have kind of thing for Dapper, because like you mentioned earlier, if I wanted to just interact with the Dapper sidecar with HTTP, I could do that. Mm -hmm. Or if I wanted to use gRPC directly, I could do that. But now I also have the ability to use like this um, this Dapper client builder to, you know, craft like a, a you know a a, um, a strongly typed clients right to so the Dapper yes. runtime, and I could use that as well. So you know, depending on how I want to write my code, like I have options to go one way or the other. Uh, yes, definitely, and it gives lots of flexibility to developers. If they want ease of these strongly typed APIs, they use it here. If they want to drop down to the HTTP layer where they want to manipulate the metadata given to Dapper or manipulate all the HTTP headers which are given to Dapper, given to Dapper uh, they can control that by using, by newing up their own HTTP client and then leveraging all the functionalities available on the HTTP client there. Got it, great, great. Yeah, this looks pretty nice. Uh -huh. um, next, we talked about ASP.NET Core integration uh, uh, for Dapper APIs. Uh, so one goal for Dapper is to integrate with all the different language uh, uh, application development frameworks which are available. When it comes to Java, it, it, it integrates with Spring Boot. When it comes to .NET, uh, it integrates with ASP.NET Core. So that certain functionalities are available to you without doing a bunch of plumbing yourself. So over here, I'm going to uh, show a very simple controller for ASP.NET Core. Uh, what it is doing is uh, it's a very um, not so secure banking application. If you want to look at it that way, it has a get API uh, uh, get controller, and then it has a bunch of these post controllers. Uh, what you notice here is that it has this annotation called topic, and so this is a very Dapper specific annotation. Over here, you are saying that, hey, I'm interested in um, events to this topic called deposit. And whenever an event happens in the configured uh, pub sub store of Dapper, uh, go ahead and invoke my this controller method. So whenever an event is published, this, this controller method will get invoked for you. So oh, it's an easy oh. way to tie into Dapper's uh, pub sub system without knowing much about it. Uh, so under the hood, it takes care of all the plumbing needed to interact with Dapper to tell Dapper, hey, these are the topics I'm interested in. It takes care of that. It, it even accepts the events when they come from Dapper and then calls into your controller method. Okay. Similarly, it also uh, shows interaction with Dapper state APIs uh, using the rich APIs, which we just talked about. Over here, you can see uh, that you get the state uh, from uh, Dapper client. Dapper client is the client we just created in the previous code, which I showed. Uh, very similar to this. It's basically doing this under the hood. It's creating a Dapper client. And uh, then using that, you can get the state information from the configured state store, and then you save the state. So now immediately your controllers become stateful uh, by virtue of Dapper running against it. And then you can, you, you can save state and retrieve state. Nice. And like yeah. what you said before, it looks like this method is doing two things. One, it's it's subscribing to a particular topic. It's saying, hey, mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in this these particular messages. And then two, it also handles it as well, right? So, you know, there's a pub this publish and subscribe is happening in the same almost in the same place. Uh, yes, true. That's true. And so this is one example of how you integrate with controllers. I'm gonna show you another um, uh, sample here. Uh, which basically interacts uh, with ASP.NET Core at the at, at the layer when you create your routes, basically. So when you are creating your routes, uh, you can tell at that point also, hey, uh, this is my post endpoint for deposit, and then um, use use a topic called deposit uh, to configure this to be invoked when a when an event comes for that topic. So, we so do I have with, to use both, or can I use either oh, or? Oh, sure. Yeah, so it, it depends on, on how you have written your application. If you have written it using controllers, you go through that uh, that route. But if you have written your application uh, by creating routes, your custom routes here, uh, you go with this, this approach. So it really okay. depends on the application design. 
Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So next I'm going to just run uh, ASP net code uh, service, the controller service. Um, using the Dapper CLI is just going to host that ASP net code application and launch a Dapper sidecar next to it. <clears throat> and then I'm going to publish some events using Dapper uh, CLI. So this is Dapper CLI. You can use it to publish some events to Dapper. Uh, this is a really convenient way to test your PubSub invocation in your service using Dapper CLI when you are uh, developing locally. So this is uh, going to publish an event to this topic called deposit. And when this event is published, what's going to happen? Uh, the event will be delivered to your ASP.NET Core application and that controller would be invoked for you. So that, that's pretty much it is showing. So it published the event. And if you look at the logs of your uh, application, you can see that, hey, I got this event and I'm, I'm, I'm executing this deposit uh, method here. Basically, it showed you uh, this, it printed this, this call here. And then if you make a, a get call here to your controller, you can see that uh, the amount which you have saved into your uh, underlying state store, uh, and that can be retrieved from the controller. So now the balance is 30. If I publish uh, one more uh, deposit event, and if I query it again, you can see it added that 15 to the state. And it's configured in the underlying state store. That means even if your application crashes, it comes back up again, uh, the state would still be available to you. Uh, so, it, so your controllers just suddenly became stateful. Got it. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's all I had from the demo perspective today. Great. Um, so for folks that are interested in Dapper, uh, I, do you have any links or anything like that that you could share to show us, well, how can we get started? Like, what are some of the things that we should be paying attention to? How can we reach out with, to the team and, and those oh, types sure, of things? Oh, sure, definitely. So uh, since Dapper is an open source uh, project, so we, we rely on help from the community, both for... Uh, uh, feature requests, contributions, and, and reporting issues. So uh, uh, we are available on GitHub, Twitter, YouTube, and, 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 and GitHub channels. And these are the links which are available. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, show uh, some of the uh, GitHub repositories which we have. So this is uh, the core runtime Dapper repository. Uh, it's github.com slash Dapper slash Dapper. And then this is the .NET SDK repository. Uh, the entire code base which we just looked at relies on this repository. It's dapper slash .NET dash SDK. Similarly, uh, we have a components contribution. So this is the components contrib uh, repository, which contains all the components which Dapper can use. Uh, if you look at state, uh, you will see all these components which have already been com contributed by the community. Uh, so these are the main repositories which are available for the Dapper runtime there. Right. So as folks are checking out the project and they want to, again, send feedbacks and issues, or or maybe they want to even contribute their own component, like this is where they could go and do that, and then they could talk to the team either on the Gitter channel or you know on one of the community calls if they have anything they want to share that way. Yes, exactly. Aman, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about Dapper and showing us that .NET integration you have. Like I've been playing with Dapper for a little bit, but I feel like you just taught me a bunch more stuff that I haven't even tried before. And so I'm definitely excited to go ahead and, and play around with it a little bit. Um, you know, what we'll do is we'll make sure some of those links and you know the samples and those types of things that you share, we'll put them in the show notes. So, you know, if folks again they want to interact with you and the team and stuff like that, that you know, they have a very easy way to do that. Um, but other than that, that's it. Um, thank you for coming on, and thank you everyone that's watching for checking out this episode of the On.Net Show. And today we learned about using Dapper, which is a distributed application runtime to be able to create microservices using our .NET application code. Thank you all for watching and take care.